platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by clicking on the following website address. HTTPS <laughs> colon contemporaneously during this meeting through, excuse me, let's begin again. HTTPS colon two slashes www.zoom dot us slash j slash nine six one eight nine 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 six five four zero, or dialing one of the following numbers one nine two nine two oh five six oh nine nine or one three oh one seven one five eight five nine two b providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting we previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting including how to access the meeting using zoom or telephonically this information is printed in the house calendar c providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access if anybody has a problem please call 271-3600 or email h c s at ledge dot state dot n h dot u s d adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting in the event the public is unable to access the meeting the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled i want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us Jennifer Four, House Committee Researcher, is the meeting host. Additional House Committee Services staff are providing support. Brad Greenland is here for technical support, and Pam Smarling and Christina Dyer are here to assist with facilitating the meeting. This is a work session on HB 16FM. A copy of the bill has been posted on the main page of the general court website under the heading remote meetings. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Okay, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. The chair recognizes the clerk of the committee, Representative Welker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Madam Chair, are you here? Yes, I am here. I am in Durham, and I am alone. Representative Keynes. I am here alone. Oops. Who's that? Uh, pardon my slowness here. I'm trying to do something. Representative Burge. Uh, I'm here. I'm alone. Representative Horrigan. I'm here in Durham and I'm alone. Representative Woodbury. I'm here alone. I heard you say you're here. Are you also alone, Representative Woodbury? Uh, yes, I'm alone. Thank you. Representative Altshore. Good morning. I'm here and I am alone in my office here in Stratham. Representative DiLorenzo. Good afternoon, I'm here and I'm alone and very happily alone. 
Why is that not typing? Here we go. Representative Burroughs. I'm here. I'm alone, although my husband, Jonathan, may come in at some point. <laughs> we'll have to see if that has to be reported later on. Representative Chase. Good morning. I am here in Rollinsville alone. Representative Kenny. Representative Kenny will be coming later. This wind is getting ridiculous. Jason. Oh, that, that's way better. Representative Kenny. He's coming late. He's coming late. So he's not here now. No. Representative Langley. I'm here in Manchester and I'm alone. Representative Stevens. I am here in Nashua alone. <laughs> Scroll down. Representative Hopper. Uh, Representative Hopper's muted. All right, is that better? Yes. All right, I am here. I am currently alone, but my wife, Brenda, and my grandson, Scott, may come in and out of the room. Representative Sylvia. I am here in Belmont alone. The clerk is here alone for the time being. Representative Gordon. Here in Bristol. Uh, my wife is in the house, but I am alone in my office. Representative Janvrin. I'm present. I am in Seabrook outside the town library, hence the wind by myself. Thank you. Um, Paul, am I supposed to report, record where they are mm -hmm. or just that they're in attendance? Just that they're in attendance. Thank you. Representative Griffin. You're muted, Barbara. <laughs> All Barbara, right. Uh, okay. I'm present alone in Bedford. Representative McLean. I'm present. My wife is present as well. Yes, with wife, I guess I put in here. I don't know. That's what I did. Uh, Joe, uh, Representative Alexander. Um, I'm here. I'm in Goffstown, and my roommate is currently not in the room, but she might be in and out. Her name's Jessica. I'm just, if you're alone at this time, I'm putting you in as alone. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, this what I have here is a roll call sheet, which is what Paul sent me. So I'm not sure how to handle this, but what I'll I think I guess that he's going to uh, tell me. Paul will check in with you, and Jennifer will check in with you after the meeting we as know to what is. to do with with the records. Um, so I got well. Thank you very much for taking the roll, um, and thank you all very very much for doing this. It is not the way we want to meet, but it's better than not meeting and not attending to our legislative responsibilities. Um, the matter before the um, committee today is House Bill 1642, and the chair recognizes the prime sponsor, Representative Hopper. You're on mute again, Paul. I mean, Gary. There you go. Yeah, it automatically mutes me. And then, so I have, okay. So anyway, I'm unmuted. Um, we are the second committee on the, this bill. And so the House has already uh, uh, passed it. <clears throat> Sorry, passed it. So what the, the bill basically does is make it illegal for any state agency, police station, police, state police, local police, from using facial recognition software to track people. And I think it's entirely consistent with our recent constitutional amendment that passed by 80% of uh, the New Hampshire residents um, 
uh, which was a right to privacy. Oh yeah, I, I'm representing uh, Hillsborough County too, uh, where and Deering. I forgot of that. Um, so, so basically to me, it's very, very fundamental that people have a right to be secure wherever they're going, that they're not being observed by officials, by, by police or anybody else, and, or not anybody else, by police specifically, by the state. Um, and so we're playing catch up. In, in 1928, there was a case that went to the United States Supreme Court. And if I could read my own writing, I'd tell you, I think it's, um, Omstead. It was an Omstead case where, uh, I believe it was police were using, uh, wiretapping to catch a criminal. And that went to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, you're not really violating the Fourth Amendment because they're you weren't actually intruding on their papers or in their building or anything else. So the Supreme Court said that that was okay. And I think any rational person today realizes that tapping people's private conversation is absolutely a, a violation of their fundamental right to be secure. Maybe not specifically in their papers, but still it's, it's a security issue. So it took about six years until the United States Congress stepped up to the plate and made that illegal, wiretapping. And wiretapping to me is a good um, um, example of what we're trying to do here. Obviously in wiretapping, if police were able to tap all, all the phones and all the cell phones anytime they felt like it, I am quite positive the police could solve a lot more crime cases. And I am absolutely positive if they could use facial recognition software along with cameras on every street corner, they could catch a lot more criminals. But the, the fundamental question to me in regards to this bill is how much liberty are you willing to concede so the police can catch more criminals? And to me, I don't think the, it's, a, it's a fair trade-off. I don't think uh, as I'm walking down the street, um, the police should be able to collect that image of me and compare it electronically with something else and know Gary Hopper's walking down Elm Street, Manchester at any given time. I don't think it's any of their business where I'm walking any given time, unless I'm in, in the, uh, unless I'm committing a crime, in which case they have other means by which to catch me for doing that. So that's, I'm not going to belabor this because it's too, it's too tedious to do this on, uh, this way, I really like talking to you guys and, and, and at the meeting. So that's basically it. It just, uh, um, if, if you, I think we can see where this issue would go if left unchecked. All you have to do is look at uh, places like China right now, and they have facial recognition software that can actually recognize people even if they're wearing a mask. Um, they keep constant tabs on all their uh, citizens. They got millions and millions of cameras all over China, and you have no liberty at all in China. And and I I want to make sure we never get there. And that's 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 all I got. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Representative. Will you be willing to answer any questions from your fellow committee members? Yes. Uh, Representative Burroughs. Can you hear me now? Yes. If I can, okay. if I can just butt in, I apologize. Um, just so you know, we've got to take time to unmute you. So oh. um, just kind of look at that little red symbol or icon and you'll see when you're ready to go. Okay, so you'll do that. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, thank you for taking my question, uh, Representative Hopper. Um, it was interesting that you brought up China um, because there's a case that just came out in the news today where there was a kidnapping in China 32 years ago and they used facial recognition technology to identify the person who's now 32 years old and to help solve the crime. So if this was implemented in the United States, would 
would that prohibit us from being able to to accomplish the same kind of thing? Um, and would it mean that 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 case would have gone unsolved? Jennifer, could you unmute uh, Representative Hopper, please? Yes. Um, yes, that would go unsolved. The, 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 that's why I'm saying it's a trade-off. If we allowed the police to wiretap for the last 80 years or whatever, 100 years, um, there's a lot of crimes that they could have solved had they been allowed to just tap every conversation we've ever had. So yes, there's a, there's a lot of um, crimes that would have been able to be prevented or solved with facial recognition software. It's just a fundamental question of whether you're willing to concede that much liberty for that much security. It's a trade-off. And I think the people of New Hampshire uh, a few years ago clearly said, 80% of them, that they believe they have a right to privacy. So I think, yes, that you could have solved that crime, but I don't believe the trade-off is, is uh, fair. If I can interrupt for just one moment, um, uh, Representative uh, Kenny has um, arrived and uh, the clerk should, um, I guess, technically call on him to report that he's here. So if Kurt, if, Ken, if Welper and Kenny could be unmuted. Representative Kenny, could you report where you are and whether you're alone? Yes. Hello, everyone. I apologize for being tardy. Um, I am in my apartment in Durham, um, and I am alone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Now, um, Representative Alexander has a question for uh, Representative Hopper. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, um, Representative Hopper, for taking my question. So I have um, really two, if that's okay. Um, when reading the, the text of the bill, it says it's only a state um, or like government entity, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and if I can follow up, like why, was there any consideration to like ban even private entities from using this software? Um, I think I, I, I didn't consider it because that's a private company and I don't think the state has any right to um, interfere with them. I mean, if Walmart wants to use facial recognition software so that when you walk in there, they can send you a text that their fishing equipment is on sale. That's, that's kind of intrusive, but it's up to them. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Al Chiller. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. So um, I understand what you're saying when, you know, there are trade-offs and I don't know that have the, had the trade-offs um, been put so um, specifically, um, everyone would agree, um, nor I, do I think that 80% of the people who voted for the uh, constitutional amendment would necessarily consider this to be a logical next step. Um, there has been just, re I know that Representative Burroughs talked about a case in China and I'm very interested in that, um, but I would like to bring up a, a, um, a case in the United States and just last August um, in New York, police were able to use facial recognition to track down an accused rapist and apprehend him within 24 hours of an attack that he perpetrated um, at knife point. And so if, for instance, that same perpetrator were to cross borders um, in trying to evade um, law enforcement and were to say, come to New Hampshire, then I think what you're, I think what this bill would be saying is that we would not be able to use those tools to apprehend this person. Um, and I'm concerned that there are already uh, facial recognition uh, being used, for instance, in social media that um, law enforcement uses right now. And I'll give you a specific example is that when children are being abused sexually and physically um, 
as part of, um, you know, for profit. And that is something that happens with regularity um, documented on, for instance, Pornhub, um, which has offered all kinds of free incentives here in the, in, um, the states during this COVID-19 quarantine time. Um, they actually broadcast um, video where you can um, ask for someone to abuse a child in front of the camera and the um, National Centers for Missing and Exploited Children and our New Hampshire ICAC are able to use um, clues from those videos and hopefully facial recognition if um, screenshots are posted on social media and it would be it's hard to imagine that someone would do that, but they do. Um, uh, to identify the children, the location, and who the perpetrators are, and I, I don't, I would absolutely not support that being a trade-off um, for hampering investigations with a really, really important tool. And on page two of the bill, in line lines one through three. Um, I'm really, really uncomfortable with um, particularly line two, data or information in violation of this subdivision shall be considered unlawfully obtained and shall be irretrievably deleted from any document in possession of the state or any court file or filing upon discovery. I know that um, as an advocate for victims of crime, to find out that the state would be in the position of having to destroy potential leads and evidence against a perpetrator would be a crushing, crushing blow. Um, and I think that um, while I understand some of the motivations for this legislation, the way that this is written out um, instead throws every opportunity to use this tool appropriately with just throwing the tool away altogether. Representative Hopper, do you want to reply? Uh, yes, I do. So um, I, I, I understand that. I, um, uh, if you've, years ago, I, I filed bill, I, am I still on? You're on. Okay. <laughs> so sorry about the interruption. So um, years ago, when I first became, was in the legislature, I passed bills to help uh, victim of sec victims of sexual abuse. Uh, having things happen in my own family, I'm acutely aware of the problem. Um, but you could, if using your same argument, you could go one step further. I, I believe it was uh, Bill Gates was on a TED talk, spoke of um, electronically chipping people. And in doing so, you'd be able to, you know, keep track of where they were all the time. You would be able to find, you would know if somebody had had a, uh, had COVID-19 and whether or not they could freely go to another country because they had uh, um, shots for it. Um, and then if everybody was chipped, you would absolutely know where everybody was at all times. And if a child was abducted, you could actually track who they were with just before the abduction and where they were once they were abducted. So there are tools to make sure that bad things never happen again. And uh, uh, um, facial recognition software is one of those tools to keep everybody safe. But my, my threshold, the way I look at things is I try, because we were, our, our, as legislators, most of us are old enough to see the winds of politics switch back and forth very rapidly. And people get elected that were just surprised even got elected it, almost instantaneously. The people are very fickle and will just kick the bums out and hire, and hire new people at a, at a moment's notice. And in doing so, the possibility of getting somebody in office that wants to abuse these tools that we now are, would be using for good against us is very, very possible. And so on, on, on tools that the government has access to, 
I always think of, you know, WWHD, what would Hitler do? What would Hitler do with those tools if he were elected? Because remember, he was elected in, in Germany. And German people were not stupid people. They were very bright people. And so when we allow police to access all these tools, facial recognition software, video cameras everywhere, microchips, yes, it would keep us safer, but how much liberty are you willing to concede for that? And to me, we, it's, it's better to stop it before it gets to a point where it's abused than, than, uh, than wait until afterwards, because then it's too late. The chair recognizes Representative Woodbury to be followed by Representative McLean and then Representative Birch. Representative Woodbury. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hopper, for taking my question. Uh, am, am I uh, still unmuted? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you, you, you explained to us that this bill is necessary uh, because it's very much like a bill which should have taken place 100 years ago to prevent wiretapping. I wonder, uh, but placing, placing this bill in the wiretapping context, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that instead of preventing surveillance, what it actually does is to prevent a, a tool useful to make surveillance sensible. And wouldn't that be the essential uh, equivalent of saying in the wiretap situation, not that you couldn't wiretap, but that you couldn't use voice recognition software to establish whose voice it was. Uh, so that instead of preventing, instead of preventing the evil of un unregulated surveillance, this bill simply limits the ability uh, to make a sensible use of that. Uh, I guess I've said enough. I, I hope you can respond. Representative Hopper. Yeah, I, I kind I kind of get the analogy, but to me, uh, I think the the using that same analogy, the the police can still wiretap, but they have to get a warrant to do so, and. But facial recognition software, my understanding is it's it's kind of like it, the same analogy would mean that they could uh, wiretap everybody and then only use that part of a criminal that was talking on the phone in a court case. So because facial recognition kind of is too broad a spectrum, so it can it just identifies everybody as they're walking down the street. So I think that's the difference. A wiretap is a specific, is targeted, and that's why you can um, uh, get a get a warrant for a wiretap on Gary Hopper's phone because it's specific and it's a specific crime. But I don't think facial recognition software works like that. And I could be totally wrong, but I don't believe so. So I think it's, it's I think the analogy falls short. Uh, thank you. Representative McLean. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. All right, great. Uh, Representative Hopper, thank you for taking my question. So I just kind of, I'm going to try to get it all in because of the muting and the unmuting, so I'll do the best job that I can. Um, but to kind of follow up on Representative Alexander Stred, um, we did get some testimony from the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police. And I think the bill addresses uh, the bulk of the concerns put forth by the Bedford Police Chief. But he, uh, item three in, in his uh, submitted testimony was that um, the bill, as written, would not allow law enforcement to use a store camera to identify um, the subject. And you were, you were talking about, you know, that a Walmart camera would be okay. Um, so, but this bill, as it's written, I think that while Walmart would be able to tape or the, the store would be able to tape, or I could even have a, a, a camera, like one of those ring cameras on my door, the, the police would not be able to make use of it. 
And so I think, you know, as I look at the actual bill itself, line 16, it says that they cannot use any facial recognition system. So I think as written, it doesn't allow you to use even the private stuff. So I guess my question would be, would you be open to modifying maybe line 16 on the bill to say any government operated facial recognition system? Because if somebody broke into my house, I would certainly want to be able to give the police the data from my ring camera or something to help them find out who broke into my house. So I guess that was my question. I just would welcome your thoughts on that. Representative Hopper. Yeah, I, I believe I understand the, the, uh, the concept. I believe the previous com committee fixed that, but I'll let them speak to that because I believe the, my understanding is the facial recognition software is uh, a, a technological ability to look at that picture and digitally identify the person and compare it to other photographs. Whereas what you're talking about is I get videotaped shoplifting again in, me, in Walmart and um, they use just my picture, which somebody says, oh yeah, that's Gary Hopper, that's okay. But using it digitally to uh, identify me compared to say, for instance, my driver's license, that would be illegal under this. So I don't, I don't think it prohibits, I, I think that uh, is, is, is unfounded, but I will let um, a repre representative the Schmidt uh, talk about that when he gets on, because they, I think the previous committee dealt with that. Thank you, Representative Birch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I want to go back to the concerns raised by uh, Representative Altschiller because I share those concerns. Um, I've been involved in my past life uh, with both training and actual uh, legal work representing individuals charged with child pornography and, and similar offenses. And what I know in general is when a computer is seized from a suspect and there are images on that computer. Let's say it's a, it's a naked person in a suggestive pose. Um, there is a big difference in terms of consequences, whether that individual is, let's say, 20 years old or that individual is 14 years old. And one of the ways that crucial question is answered is the effort to determine who is that person in that image. And the way that is done is to run that image through databases of known exploited children. And when a match is reached and you know the age and identity of that person, then you can easily determine the age of the, of the, uh, uh, the person involved. So that is crucial to the apprehension of child predators. In fact, Interpol's child sexual exploitation database, which again would be unavailable for use, it would be in the banned category, has more than 1.5 million images of exploited children and has helped identify over 19,000 identi uh, exploited children. This bill would simply make that impossible. And I'm wondering if that was taken into consideration. Representative Hopper. Yeah, I, I, uh, thank you, Representative Birch. Um, I don't think that was necessarily specifically uh, taken into consideration, but I think my, my previous answer still stands as to, yes, you, there are many crimes you could solve by uh, constant monitoring, monitoring of everybody, but how much liberty are you willing to concede to get there? And to me, this is facial recognition software. There was, I was just reading in another report this morning uh, out of uh, MIT, 
and they, they referred to a uh, Italian uh, criminologist, I believe, who has determined that through facial recognition software, he's pretty confident that he can determine who is going to be a criminal. Because in his words, uh, criminals have ape-like features. So, I don't know, I, I just, it, 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 the technology itself uh, is, is frightening to me. And it's, it's, it scares me for my children and grandchildren as to how much liberty they're gonna lose uh, just for that, that uh, those cases where we can all see why the, this, this technology would be helpful. But I think uh, long-term it, it is, a, is a threat to people's liberty. So I still, I mean, I'm willing to accept amendments to it or whatever to get it passed, but I, I but it's not, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with the bill itself anyway. Thanks. Thank you. Are you still willing to take more questions? Yeah. Okay, then next is um, uh, Representative Harrigan. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Sorry about that. Yes, I had a, I remember a conversation I had um, when the bill was about to come to the house with the Manchester police chief. And I guess what he said is uh, the same as what the Bedford police chief said pretty much, but he, he, he pointed out that like, you know, there's cameras all over the place, almost all of which have can be used for facial recognition, not all kinds of, you mentioned, you mentioned Walmart, for example, with all kinds of other businesses and private individuals, and they do use that video all the time for crime. And he said, if we pass this bill as is, then everybody would be able to use this technology except the police force. So he, um, he found that objectionable, of course, and I, that- uh, Is that your question, people. Representative Hargan? Yes, I guess more of a comment in the, uh, would you believe so? And uh, so that was, uh, I just wanna say I've heard that from other police officers other than uh, the one from Bedford who emailed us. So. Thank you. Representative Hopper? Yeah, um, yeah, I heard that same thing too. And I think if you uh, folks remember earlier this year, we had a Manchester policeman say, basically saying that uh, we were talking about surveil video surveillance of the streets in Manchester. And he conceded that, you know, if he had his way and had the money, he'd have surveillance cameras everywhere. And yes, we could have surveillance cameras everywhere and, and we could have uh, facial recognition software so that everybody coming in or out of a, a church or a synagogue could be recorded and the police would know exactly who was going in or out. And if they exceeded the 10 person limit, and that, would, that would be very effective law enforcement. Um, but to his, to uh, Representative Horrigan's question, yes, Walmart can have this technology. Yes, Sears, or I guess we don't have Sears anymore, but the, the mall can have this technology. But the fact of the matter is Walmart and Sears can't arrest me. Walmart and Sears can't investigate me for crime or uh, uh, possibly arrest me or you know, um, be motivated to keep track of my whereabouts and, and things like that. Those, those private entities uh, can use the software, whatever they, they want. It's whether or not we want the state, which has so much resources and so much power to have that additional power to keep track of its citizens. Um, Representative Gordon. Wait, wait, uh, Representative Gordon, you haven't been unmuted yet. Wait. Trying. I'm not sure what's taking so long. Can you unmute, unmute on your own screen? There we yes. go. Good. Representative Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Hopper, for taking the questions. I, I, I think I had maybe have two questions and a comment. The first question I have goes to the 
issue I think that's been raised by other committee members, and that is that it seems to me, and I think you've acknowledged the fact that facial recognition could serve a valuable purpose. Uh, but I think what you said is on balance, it's better to allow perhaps crimes to be committed in certain circumstances in order to protect people's privacy. So I, I, the, in, under the Fourth Amendment and under the New Hampshire Constitution as well, there are provisions with regard to privacy. Uh, and people's homes can't be searched, for example. But there are exceptions, and specifically exceptions made so that the police can get a warrant. And if they do it to go to a court and show probable cause that a crime uh, could be committed or was about to be committed, or they could, in fact, get a warrant to uh, undertake activities which would invade people's privacy. And I guess the question, the first question I have is, did you consider in putting this bill together that law enforcement would be able to get warrants in order to use this technology when a, there's probable cause that a crime is being committed? Um, that, that's a good point. I don't know how you, how you, uh, I, I would be, uh, certainly, uh, uh, amendable to an amendment, uh, that, that allowed that, but I'm not sure how technically you get there. So I don't know enough about it to know that, that that's doable, but if it is, that, that seems totally reasonable and it might, uh, uh, um, help with uh, Rep Representative Alschulitzer and Representative Birch's uh, issues with the bill too. But I, I don't know how you get there. Thank you. Repres Representative uh, DiLorenzo. Thank you for taking my question, Representative Harper. Um, are you aware of any New Hampshire state agencies or departments um, law enforcement or, or otherwise, who currently use face rec recognition technology? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, Representative Griffin. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hopper, section two of the bill uh, makes a change to motor vehicle statutes. Um, line 22, page two provides that there's a modification to a section of driver's licenses and it deletes the words for purposes of this chapter. Um, in that particular provision, there is a specific reference to the department being prohibited from using facial recognition technology in connection with taking or retaining any photograph or digital image. I would like to know what the purpose of deleting that is and I expect the answer is so that it doesn't uh, keep it as to the driver's license chapter. It would be under this new provision that you're providing. But when you answer it, could you explain how you balance that with the fact that the motor vehicle statute has a specific provision that allows individuals to make the choice to not have their image retained in the motor vehicle database? Representative Hopper? Um, am I still, am I unmuted? You're ready to go. Okay. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I just, I was reading over the bill again today and I didn't pick up on that. So I, I, I I'm choking on that one. Um, Representative Jandrin. Um, I didn't realize it was going to pop up and say, do you want to unmute? So Gary, thanks for taking my question. Um, last year, well, it was 2018. We had a bill come through, uh, a concurrent resolution came through the House and Senate, was passed on to the voters 
to amend the constitution. And I just want to read that amendment that was made. Uh, it added the words, an individual's right to live free from government intrusion in private or personal information is a natural, essential and inherent. So we've had a few bills this year that seek to define what that meant. I'm assuming your bill that you're proposing here, uh, whether it's amended or not, is in fact uh, defining that inherent right to privacy uh, that's in the Constitution rather than allowing court cases to go to a court to be adjudicated to further define this amendment made to the Constitution. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the the uh, amendment that we just passed by 80% of the population, basically, I think the voters of New Hampshire, my constituents, said that they believe they have a right to privacy and without government intrusion. And I think this is just putting, uh, I think, meat on the bones, as somebody phrased it earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have three people who want to speak a second time, Representatives Burroughs, um, Al Schiller, and Gordon. Would it be all right, and Birch, um, would it be all right um, if we put those on hold and hear from the chair um, of the subcommittee in eDNA, perhaps, or would you rather that I continue with taking questions from the committee? Who would you like to recognize, Representative Smith? Well, I would like to recognize if if there's no objections, Maybe I would like to recognize Peter. I would like to recognize Peter Schmidt. Okay. <clears throat> Give me just a minute. Okay. Representative, Representative Schmidt. I'm here. Good. Go for it. Okay, well, I certainly appreciate the, the uh, colloquy that I've been listening to since the uh, end of the roll call anyway. Um, uh, excellent questions that by and large, the EDNA committee did not consider because it's not part of our expertise and purview. Uh, so we were looking at the aspects of the bill to which we were uh, invited to participate. Um, we heard very excellent and expert testimony with regard to the dangers of um, effectively of facial recognition technology. Uh, so th there are several aspects to discuss here. Uh, first of all, um, th this bill, as I think has been remarked on, doesn't do anything to private businesses' uh, uh, right to employ uh, cameras in their stores. Um, uh, and, uh, and we know that they, they, many of the stores do, virtually all of them, I, probably. I don't look in every store I go into to see whether there are cameras up on the ceiling or any in the corners, but I think it's a fairly safe assumption that we are videotaped um, or photographed in, in a number of establishments. That, that This bill doesn't affect that. Um, uh, secondly, one of, the, one of the aspects that was troubling to us with regard to facial recognition technology is that uh, it's not the same for everybody. If you're a young white male, um, uh, the, the chances of, of an accurate uh, depiction um, are, are pretty good. Uh, from there on up in age uh, or away from white uh, uh, Caucasian members of society, uh, the quality of the reproduction or of the recognition uh, deteriorates or is decreasing anyway. Uh, that's an issue that people want, want to give some consideration to because to the degree that either somebody is recognized as being somebody that they aren't or that the person who is that person is not recognized, uh, that's not a good thing in terms of being a reliable resource for law enforcement or any other purpose. Um, so that, 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 that's one of the considerations. But, uh, but facial recognition 
basically. And, and that's why we switched because the original bill, as you probably have seen, uh, talked about facial surveillance systems. Um, and uh, we've seen that in the case of the Ternayev brothers, uh, the, Marath the Boston Marathon bombers, uh, I, I imagine virtually all of us saw the footage where the two brothers came marching into the, you know, focal uh, range of the, of the camera. You could see them and, and then they disappeared from that camera's uh, purview and, and uh, not, it was picked up in the next camera's purview virtually s seamlessly. So you saw how many of the stores on Newbury Street, I think, had such capabilities. Uh, so, and you could see, you know, they had the pressure cookers in their, uh, in their backpacks, or at least very large bulges in their backpacks. Uh, so th here the question was not, are these the bombers? That case was made pretty quickly. Um, but the question was, who are these people? So facial surveillance is very valuable for capturing actions such as shoplifting or a robbery or whatever, um, but then the question is, who is this individual or, or who are these individuals if it's more than one? Um, and then uh, the, the reality is then the police have to go trying to figure out not uh, who done it, but who are the people? Um, and that, that is one of the advantages of facial recognition technology is that a the images are duplicate are, sorry are digitalized um, and in that manner they can be immediately compared to the database that exists everywhere in governments a la fingerprints okay so to the degree that the that the that the 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 digitalized uh, images can be compared and, and, and the, the database, of course, would have a name associated with that identity, um, with that individual. And, and thereby, you could almost instantaneously, uh, to the degree that the de technology is, is accurately doing this, already referenced its, its, uh, its flaws at the moment, uh, but to the degree that it's recognized immediately, um, it's a tremendous law enforcement tool. There's no question about that. And I really welcome this committee's uh, expertise in dealing with the issues that have been raised a, a number of times in, uh, uh, in questions to Representative Hopper. So, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Representative um, Schmidt. Um, Representative McGuire, do you have anything that you want to add to um, what's been said so far? Representative McGuire was on the subcommittee that dealt with this bill in eDNA. Um, yes, Madam Chair, thank you very much. One thing that I got from your questions and comments is there is a bit of confusion between the idea of a photograph and a facial recognition system. There, this bill does not ban anyone, including the police, from taking pictures of people, whether they're suspect or they're just walking down Elm Street in Manchester. What it does is prevent them from maintaining a database of pictures of faces with the associated data, and then using a computer to compare them. If they want to get a photo from Walmart of a suspected shoplifter and they show it to the local police and, they, and the local police says, oh yeah, that's Gary Hopper, we know all about him. Or that they, the uh, owner of a store that was robbed looked at it and said, yeah, that guy came in last week. He comes in twice a week. I, I don't know his name, but he lives around here somewhere. People are still allowed to look at pictures and recognize them. What we're prohibiting with this bill is the development of a database of pictures of people and, the, and their identities. And so that is why we, we 
chose to ban the DMV from use, from doing it because they have a database of pictures. Most people keep their pictures on file and that contains a great deal of, of information like your name, your address, your birth date. Some of them still probably have social security numbers. You don't want that data stolen or used. And so this bill does not prohibit them from keeping a database. It keeps them from using it in a facial recognition system which is a different matter entirely. Um, that's it. And as Representative Schmidt said, right now facial recognition has a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives. It is not that useful unless you have a very large database and you have pictures of the people, a large database of the people you wanna to compare to and um, nobody in New Hampshire, as far as we know, has that. Uh, what else I got there? The bill specifically exempts law enforcement cooperation with federal agencies that have used facial recognition. And in fact, it would allow uh, cooperation with other agencies as long as we don't use the, the facial recognition ourselves. We could still send photos from a, ro a robbery in Salem to the Massachusetts police. And if they say without telling us they've used facial recognition, oh, that's uh, Joe Blow from Lawrence, uh, we'll, we'll arrest him and send him to you. That's That was what we thought would be the appropriate use is that we use the pictures we have and we use people to recognize them, but we do not allow law enforcement to maintain and use a database of pictures. There are, it would be possible if there were specific cases where someone wanted to allow that. For example, that database of abused children might be allowable, uh, but, at, or victims of crimes, whatever. But right now we don't want to maintain a general database of people, partly to protect their privacy and freedom, partly because it would generate too many false positives and not have the right kinds of, of um, ah, sorry, distract that. And um, it would all, having such a database would also be a major incentive for a lot of people and agencies to invade our privacy by putting up photo, putting up cameras in more places than there are now. And that's something that I'm concerned with. Uh, as long as you can only use a photo for, to have a policeman look at it or an individual for that identity, it's limited. And how much invasion of your privacy they can do is limited. If you can use a database of everybody in the country and and instantaneously say, well, it's one of this dozen people. That's an incentive for a lot of people and agencies to go out and put cameras in more places. And I don't believe that's something that, that we want to have in New Hampshire. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, are there any questions for Representative McGuire? I know you have general things. Any questions specifically for Representative McGuire? Representative Woodbury has a question. Am I okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, this is actually is a question which might be answered either by Representative Schmidt or Representative McGuire. Uh, but I'd like to know in the EDNA hearings whether or not there was a discussion comparing the accuracy of facial recognition software and the accuracy of in-person human-to-human identification, which we've known is very fallible over the years. And I just wonder if there was a discussion as to which, which came out on top. Uh, yes, we did talk a little bit about that. We didn't ourselves analyze it because we're not experts. We had some people from the industry and some experts from UNH working with us. And in general, people are better at facial recognition than machines. And 
this that may not be that way for long, but right now they are, particularly with things like uh, if you're dealing with people with beards, you're dealing with older people, you're dealing with non-Caucasians, you're dealing with children, or if you've changed your hairdo or got new glasses, uh, we people are are much better at do, at dealing with that than than machines. Um, Representative Birch, did you have a question for yes. Representative McGuire or Schmidt? Yes, I would follow up with Representative McGuire. I'm concerned, Representative, about your last statement. I've spent decades with people who look through mugshot books at picture after picture. After the first 20 or 30 or 50 uh, mugshots they look at, their level of identification is almost nil. And lineups are notorious for similar problems. So we know that people identification, and there are hundreds and hundreds of studies to show people identification of pictures and lineups are one of the largest contributors to false convictions that we have in this country. I have yet to see a single study, and I'm wondering if you have seen a single study that supports a computer going through uh, 500 mugshots is less accurate than a person going through 500 mugshots, because I simply don't believe that. Uh, I haven't seen such a study exactly. And as I said, we didn't do that sort of study. We don't have that information. Uh, but the people who, who were testified at our subcommittee work sessions were positive that facial recognition systems had a very high false positive rate. They are not as bad, and that's something that uh, we need to deal with. We need to realize when we're, we're dealing with these systems. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I've looked at the attendees and I can't find uh, whomever is on this list representing the police chiefs. Um, could you um, indicate who you are? I think that would be Beth Sargent. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that would be good. She is here. I can allow her to talk. Okay. <clears throat> Unmute now. Unmute yes. now. Yes, you're on now. Hi, Reverend. Hi, Representative Smith. It's Beth Sargent. Good. We hey, Chief you. Goldstein. Okay, can I pass the baton to Chief Goldstein? Chief Goldstein is on the line and prepared to speak and answer Certainly. questions. Certainly. All right, I just thanks. have to. We, I'll, we, we, I'll text him. Been identified, so you have to let us know who he is. All right, Jen. How how can I let? What do you need? His email. What or is phone his phone number? number? Yeah, I need his the the okay. last four digits of his phone number. Okay, gotcha. Okay, it should be nine seven eight two. Oh, I do not see. Okay, hold on. Let me let me just text him. Oh, he's sending me a note. I'll get you that. Um, he says I he can see you. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, if oh, hold on. He's gonna send me the number. Unless if, if he's online. Um, oh, could be Jen six six zero three eight six. Um, but you said he could see us, so that means he's connected online. Is that right? Yes. Is he guest Gaw G A W, maybe? Uh, let me let me ask him. G A W. Okay. 
Um, why don't we see if that can be um, sorted out? Um, I don't want to take Thank you. all our time. And maybe Brad can help go through those phone numbers to see. Um, yep. let's... If you can email me. OK. OK. Um, I really did want them next. Um, OK. Uh, I think what happens is the phone number that is the phone number that they were told to dial, not necessarily what their phone number is, because that's happened before. And we do have, what, four people here who, or five, who have phone numbers. Um, so that's not much help. Um, okay. Um, uh, the chair recognizes Jean Ruska. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Good, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to chime in. I just want to underscore a couple points um, that one has been raised and a couple that haven't. I would just underscore Representative McGuire's concerns about reliability. We do not consider facial recognition a reliable technology. And I'll note that the government agency that's actually in charge of evaluating new technologies, NIST, has also ruled that this technology is not reliable. Um, it's one of the reasons that certain companies are, are not using it right now because of the rate of false positives, particularly because of the rate of false positives amongst people of color. And I'll just note, we know people of color are, are already disproportionately subjected to the criminal legal system. So we're particularly concerned about using a technology that has that same disparity in its ability to identify people. Um, but I also want to go back a little bit and kind of explain why we support starting with a prohibition on this technology. We have come before this committee before in support of legislation that is trying to create guardrails around a certain technology or a certain procedure that's already in robust use. If you can remember last year, there was a bill about DNA, right? And trying to create a privacy guardrail around the existing use of DNA. And what we know is once a technology is in rampant use, it is really, really hard to restrict it. It's so hard, if not impossible, to put the genie back in the bottle. And our concern is that this technology will become in such robust use that when, if we try and go back afterwards and restrict it and contain it, it'll be next to impossible. And so the benefit for us with this bill is you start with a prohibition. I think we fully expect that even as early as next year, you could see bills that come in and try and create exceptions that this legislature could consider on a case-by-case -case basis. You start with a prohibition and then allow people to come forward in a transparent public manner where the public can see how this technology might get used. The reliability of this technology can be assessed. And this legislature then on a case-by-case -case basis can create exceptions, can allow the technology, whether it's with a warrant, whether it's specifically in cases of lost children, you can create those exceptions, but it's so much easier to proactively do that on a case-by-case -case basis going forward than it is trying to establish privacy guardrails and restrict a privacy technology once it's already in robust use. And I'll just note the example of whether eyewitness testimony is reliable or not. Eyewitness testimony is unreliable, which is one of the reasons why it has taken decades to try and establish very specific procedures for how that process is done. This legislature actually recently passed a bill establishing guidelines on how eyewitness identification is to be done. Um, because there are ways to make it more reliable um, than not. There are no such guidelines right now with facial recognition. There are no restrictions. There are no regulations as to how to use it properly or how to use it improperly, how to make it more reliable. It's, it's no man's land. It's kind of a free for all right now with this technology. And so again, the benefit of starting with a prohibition is you, you start with 100% civil liberty protection. 
And then you allow this legislature to consider next year ways that this technology can be used. And as you consider that, you can then establish procedures for how it can be used. If it's a warrant, what needs to be shown? How do you ensure that if a warrant is granted, that bystanders are not captured while you're trying to narrow in on a particular person? Um, and so right now, the question was asked of whether there's any New Hampshire state agency that uses this technology. And to be honest, I'm not sure if there is because I'm not convinced that if a, if a police department decided to use this technology that they would notify the public. Um, we know that there are cases where law enforcement use technologies that, that where the public is not notified, where it's actually kept confidential that law enforcement is using that technology. And so again, I know I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but if you start with a prohibition and allow this legislative body to consider individual uses going forward, the public is notified. That is a very transparent process. You have public hearings. The public is notified that this technology will be used. They are, they are allowed to chime in and speak up on whether they are comfortable with this technology being used. Right now, I expect law enforcement are actually talking with private companies who want to sell them this technology, but we don't know that. We're not a part of that conversation. And we won't know the day that the technology is adopted. And so for us, it's not that we're looking to prohibit this technology completely forever with no exceptions. The goal is to start with a prohibition so that we can then have an informed, transparent conversation going forward about how maybe this technology can be used in limited capacities with very specific established procedures and guardrails. Um, so those are the points I wanted to raise. I'm happy to take questions. Um, Representative Burroughs. Sorry, there you go. Okay, there. Um, yes, um, thank you for taking my question. I was wondering if you might be able to respond. I actually, uh, to a conversation that I had with the Chief of Police of Jackson, New Hampshire, um, who felt that the scientific um, efficacy, validity, and reliability of technology is something that should be um, handled in the court system rather than by the legislature. And he, he gave the example of dog sniffing dogs. Um, you know, some of them are more reliable than others based on, on the training that they get. Um, there's also been cases involving blood spatter, depending on who the expert is and, and, um, and, and also technology around bite marks. So I'm wondering if you could respond to the comments that he made, which I thought were pretty interesting. Thank you for that question, Representative. That I actually strongly disagree with that. I, I can't imagine that courts want to be the decider about whether technology is reliable or not. Judges are not technological experts. Um, and I, obviously representatives aren't necessarily technological experts or not. Um, but to me, it, it, it is actually the legislature's job to kind of decide this sort of issue about whether certain technologies should be used um, and, and whether, if they are allowed to be used, what the procedures are. Um, I think this goes to a concern that Representative Hopper raised, um, that the voters approved a very, very broad constitutional amendment. And I think one of the reasons you're seeing privacy bills is that voters have concerns and legislators have concerns about the court being left to try and figure out what part one, article 2B means. I actually think it is the responsibility of the legislature to flesh out that constitutional amendment and to make a decision about what privacy rights mean it, when it comes to informational privacy like this. Um, and so as, as a voter and as, as a, somebody who cares deeply about privacy, I'm very nervous about simply deferring to the courts to make really complex decisions about whether technology is reliable or not. They'll have to make case by case decisions, obviously. Um, but I strongly encourage this legislature to be proactive in considering individual privacy considerations um, because I would, I would like to see part one article two be fleshed out in statute rather than waiting for the courts to do it in response to you know, whatever random case may come their way. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jen, have we been able to sort out the problem with um, uh, the police chief? We are still working on it, whether he's going to call in. Uh, Jen, 
Um, I do have, I believe that it's um, the name David. I just have him on the phone. Um, I believe he is David. And um, if you're okay with it, I can go ahead and just give him the permission to talk. And I think that- Absolutely. All right, yeah. here we go. We'll see if it's uh, the correct person. David, can you, can you talk? Hello, it is not me. Okay, different David. All right, not the right one. All right, I will keep working on it. My apologies. Nice. Okay. Um, we can't just click on these telephone numbers and see who's on each one of them. They're only. Um, what we could do um, is if you are Chief Goldstein calling from one from a telephone, um, if you could press star nine to raise your hand, we will recognize you. Thank you. I don't see anyone. Well, this concerns me because I think it's important that we do hear from um, uh, the individual who's representing the police chiefs. I think it's an important uh, part of, uh, of what we're trying to do. Um, let me then go back to the people who had I hope you're all sort trying to sort that out. Let me go back to the people who had uh, questions. Ah, wait, was that someone? No. Um, uh, Representative Al Schiller, did you have uh, something you wanted to say? I'm sorry, just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my question goes back to Representative Schmidt and um, Representative McGuire, who were on the subcommittee. Um, and I'm curious um, about whether you had, during the subcommittee's um, time together, had you considered some of the programs that we are currently using? Um, for instance, the VIP, the Victim Identification Program, um, that is the program that we are using right now um, to combat child exploitation. Um, and was there consideration made for, for instance, the sex offender registry or for any of um, most wanted lists that are done by municipalities who, you know, put up pictures of people who have committed, um, you know, who are, you know, known to law enforcement and they need to let the let, not let the public know that there is someone at large who's a danger. Um, so had the committee considered those three um, things that are being used right now and was it the committee's intention um, to throw away this tool altogether and only bring it back as an exception to a rule um, or you know had that had it not been phrased in quite that way. Are we going to rec represent McGuire with that? Um, Representative McGuire or Schmidt, I believe both were on that subcommittee. So I'm open to either. I don't see Representative Schmidt on my screen anymore, but I think he's still here. Okay, are they still here? Or yes. Okay, P uh, Representative McGuire or Schmidt, can you answer that? Representative McGuire. Recognize, yes, I can. To answer your question, Representative Al Schiller, no, we did not consider those specific. I'm not still muted again. No, we hear you. We okay. hear you. Uh, we are not as familiar with them as you are because we're obviously a different committee. That's why we're both committees are at it. We have no, this bill would not prohibit anyone posting information or pictures of people they are suspicious of. Most wanted lists could, could still be posted at the post office or town hall or whatever. What it prohibits is having an automatic system that would compare those pictures to some other database. It's not the use of photos of suspects or even of convicted sex offenders or whatever that is the issue. It's the automatic matching of some photo of someone in some 
circumstance with that database that the bill would prohibit. So I don't believe it would affect any of those systems you, you mentioned or as they are in use right now, although I'm not sure because I'm not familiar with the details. Thank you, Representative Gordon. Representative Gordon. I think, um, I, and I think uh, Representative uh, McGuire could answer the question perhaps, but I think the, 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 the problem I'm having is the, getting back to the constitutional amendment that we recently adopted and defining privacy, because it seems to me that facial recognition is used as we've all been describing, is used today by police to identify people because that's the way we identify people by virtue of their faces. And we do that humanly with our eyes. And the issue here is an issue of not whether or not we can identify people, it's the use of technology to do that. In the law, when you the standard that's constantly used is expectation of privacy. When people are out in public and they uh, make themselves available in public, they have no expectation of privacy. So I'm trying to figure out how we apply the standard of expectation of privacy to a facial recognition system. And in, in that if people are out in public, I'm not sure that they have an expectation of privacy. I think what really the bill gets at is we're just offended that technology is used, being used to identify us. And I, and I think Representative McGuire, you specifically addressed that by saying, hey, what, what, what we really wanna do is prohibit databases. Uh, and so I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how the legal standards in this particular case would be applied and whether we're really talking about privacy or technology. Representative um, DiLorenzo. Um, just quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we do have the chief on the line um, now. All right, if it's all right with everyone, let's hear him. Okay, just a moment. Chief Goldstein? Yes, did that work? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Certainly. And I appreciate the opportunity as always. Uh, I must tell you, though, that as a police officer, I'm very worried about Zoom because I've been in a lot of houses and I'm wondering if I violated the Fourth Amendment over the last few weeks, the number of houses I've been in. That's a joke, I'm sorry. Well, I, I knew you meant it as a joke, but we're kind of I not in an, in an entertaining mood at the moment. <laughs> uh, the, I think uh, Chief Profonsky's uh, remarks uh, pretty well underscore how the chiefs feel about this. I took some notes on some of the comments that I did hear uh, and I'd like to uh, address just a couple of those for the committee's benefit. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, to use wiretapping as an analogous situation is really uh, way out in left field. Um, uh, wiretapping since the beginning, uh, quite frankly, um, has always been very, very uh, regulated by the courts. In fact, it's probably harder to get a wiretap warrant than a search warrant today. And uh, as an old time uh, undercover guy who did a lot of wiretaps, I'm very familiar with that. So I don't think that that particular argument holds a great deal of, um, of credence uh, relative to this. Uh, council brought up a very interesting point about um, uh, starting from a particular uh, level where everything is prohibited and then we work from there. We, on the other hand, will look at it just the opposite way. Uh, we feel that uh, by giving us the opportunity to do this, as case law has developed over time, uh, we can certainly uh, comply with that. And we know that that will happen. So we're looking at this kind of as a blank slate, if you will. 
Uh, I understand that people would like data-driven information. Uh, I realize that there is not a lot, but I will offer you this, and this is from your own organization. This is from the National Conference of State Legislatures. And I quote, most biometric systems have a high accuracy rate, more than 95% when matching a biometric against a large database of biometrics or against the originally uh, enrolled biometric. And quite frankly, the FBI right now maintains a, um, <clears throat> a repository of over 72.6 million records uh, that can be accessed legally. Uh, so I would offer that to the committee as well. So there is some data that is being developed. Um, our question really, quite frankly, is um, to have an outright ban right now, we feel is inappropriate and that we can certainly work on this with the committee and with anybody else that's interested in trying to design some uh, parameters within which we can work. Uh, and certainly to coin a phrase that I've heard many, many times over the 10 years that I've been coming to the legislature, uh, this particular bill we feel is not ready for prime time. Uh, so we would like, um, like that uh, to be considered as well. Uh, to exchange certain rights, uh, if you will, for the uh, commission of crimes, I would ask the representative with all due respect to go to the families of the 9-11 victims or go to the families of the marathon bombing victims and see how they feel about that. Uh, knowing how those systems work, what happened, uh, actually being involved to some degree with those and with individuals who were uh, victims of those particular situations, uh, certainly they would not agree that that's a trade-off. And finally, I would offer that, uh, yes, China does what China wants to do. We, we certainly hear a great deal about that in the news today, but I would also refer you to England and Israel uh, who have been using uh, these systems for quite a period of time. And it's because of the Israeli system uh, that we were able to find the two marathon bombers as quickly as we did. And certainly I'm open to any questions that the committee might have. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, we're always happy to hear from you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, it, I want to just stop for a minute and take um, the committee's temperature. We've been at this for an hour and a half, and um, it is straining to try to go through this process. It's difficult without us being in the same room, and I'm sympathetic to that. Um, I want a sense of where you want to go. There are a couple of possibilities. Um, one is to keep on going for a while today if we think we're moving towards a point. Another is to see if we can schedule another work session. Um, and that is not in my control. It's in the control of the wonderful staff who have um, have to do that. Um, we do have another session scheduled, which I had listed as an executive session for May 28th, which is uh, a week from Thursday. Um, I guess I wanna know whether we think that there is any way that we can get to yes, with amendments, I think it's clear we nobody seems to want to get to yes without amendments, including the prime sponsor, or um, I will not even pretend that we can, that it would make any sense to do an interim study because there really aren't going to be working interim studies this summer. Um, so, um, the choice that we have is basically yes, yes with an amendment or no, and is there some guidance I can get from you as to how you want to proceed? Um, Perhaps um, I've already put out my request through a text to see if we could get another meeting before the 28th 
but I haven't gotten an answer, so I don't know. Uh, Representative Woodbury. Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd be glad to give you a sense of my temperature on this. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not, I'm not in favor of this bill. I'm not in favor of working uh, toward an amendment for it. And I am in favor of either ITL or at the appropriate time laying it on the table. And my reason is twofold. First of all, in this, uh, in this time, this sort of special time that we have, our, our ability to work is severely compromised, not only in point of time, but in point of efficiency and ability to get together and really communicate. There is no particular need to rush this bill through. This is not a bill that is on the forefront of anybody's, I mean, it's certainly on the forefront of the sponsors, but it's certainly not on the forefront of where we're going. It can certainly wait and it can certainly be uh, done in a, a good thorough way. There's nothing more clear to me from this afternoon's conversation that this bill is in total disarray. And I mean that as, as gently and as nicely to all concerned as I possibly can express it, but we are not close to working this thing out. And it just seems to me that it's not, uh, it's not fruitful to beat our heads against the stone on this with the limited time and resources that we have. Now, the second point that I want to get to is that uh, what we're dealing here with is whether or not we will accept or reject a, a, a simple element of science. This is not, this bill has nothing to do with whether or not there are more or less cameras set up and more or less miles of film taken of people walking around the streets. This is about the science of what you do with that information. I want to contrast uh, the science of facial recognition with the idea of somebody sitting in front of a TV screen after an eight hour shift and making judgment about who's who. Now, we don't know, we have no way of knowing based on the record we have in front of us, who, who is better equipped to do that? And we aren't gonna know that between now and June 11th um, or whatever later date this bill comes up. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I listen to scientists. I, I, I'm not a scientist, I respect them. If this is a bill that can be made, if this is a science that can be made better, so be it. Fair enough, you certainly, if you're gonna use a science, you want it to be accurate. Uh, I don't. I don't favor the idea of a blanket prohibition and then working against it. I think we can do this right the first time. We don't have to do it today, and we don't have to do it a week from today or a month from today. It can be done in a regular business, in a regular way when we're all back to business as usual. Uh, I just want to end by saying I, I'm reminded of the old maxim. Uh, Marry, marry in haste, repent at leisure. And I think we're in danger of marrying in haste if we go just jam this thing forward as best we can. So that's, those are my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Woodbury. Representative Burke. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'm in agreement with Representative Woodbury. I'm not gonna repeat what he said because he says it better than I. Um, I do want to observe just in passing, since this question has come up a couple times, that the most recent information from what's referred to as NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, has found that the error rate is 0.08% um, in the algorithm use as opposed to 4.1% just a few years ago. So the accuracy of, of this system is just skyrocketed. Uh, courts have notoriously been, uh, notoriously is the wrong word, courts always pay attention to technology and should it be admissible or should it not be? We have what's called the Dover test. Courts routinely evaluate 
whether technology is uh, good technology or bad, it's what they do every day of the week. Uh, the problem I have, which Representative Woodbury didn't mention, is the difficulty built into this bill with any further legislative or court evaluation of facial recognition technology should we pass this bill. There are two provisions. One provision says any evidence collected relative to this program has to be immediately destroyed. And then further provisions say that no legislative committee nor court can utilize any data information uh, or evidence derived from facial recognition technology. So if we wanted to evaluate two years from now, uh, is this program a good program? Is it a bad program? How has it worked? How is it not? We're gonna have a hard time as a legislative committee if this passes, being able to deal with any data. So I think this bill should be ITL'd and if it's taken up next year, then, then fine. It's also not an emergency COVID related bill which I think is what we're supposed to be trying to focus on. On that last point, I guess I would like to disagree with you. Um, and that is that I look back to what happened after 9-11 and I look back to the Patriot Act and I look back to how many of our civil liberties were willingly given up because of the emergency of the moment. And I believe that we are in the same period where many of our civil liberties are going to be challenged, um, whether it's with facial recognition or something else. They're going to be challenged. We're going to be asked to agree to do things that philosophically I find offensive and that I actually think a number of you would, would find offensive. And that was why I thought it was very important that the committee have a chance to look at this bill um, and not because I knew where we would come out, but because of believing that we have consistently tried to be sensitive to our role to respect civil rights and civil, and civil liberties. Um, I have listened carefully to what everyone has said. I believe the exigencies of the time make it very, very difficult for us to find a way to thread the needle, to find what is the narrowest uh, protection that we could put in legislation, not to have it be too expansive, but, but to have it important. And I don't see a way for the committee to do that. So while I think this is the time, and I think the issue is incredibly important, and I thank the prime sponsor for bringing the bill both through eDNA and to us now. I personally don't see a way for the committee to get to yes. Um, and uh, I guess what I would, we do have, um, we do have an executive session scheduled for 10 o'clock on the 28th and I'm going to keep that because we're not voting today um, what I would like to propose is that we end this work session, that if there are individuals or a number of people on the committee and those who aren't on the committee who might want to, but it would have to be people on the committee who would submit an amendment to see if there is a way that we could get to yes, then this gives you 10 days to do it, to do an amendment, to propose, to get to OLS in time for them to do it. And it might be that with Gary and others, we might be able to find some small piece that makes sense. And so my proposal would be that um, if the majority of the committee agree, we end the work session now, we come back at 10 a.m. on the 28th for an executive session where we may or may not have an amendment to consider. 
Does that make sense to, to the group? Can you just, you know, indicate? So. Um, I don't see, thank you, Gary, I was looking for that. I don't see another way. Um, and I don't know if we would have had a different outcome if we weren't sitting in 25 different locations without the ability to see each other, to be in the same room, to check body language, to be informal, all of that is missing from the great work that this committee does. And um, this isn't a time for us to, to do something that isn't, that we don't all feel is right. So if there are no objections, I would, um, I would close, well, before I do that, if there are people who are listening, who would like to continue to either contact the entire committee or to contact one or two people on the committee to see about maybe if they've come up with something that would make sense, I would urge everybody to do it. Um, we have almost this whole week, it would, I think, probably be necessary if there is an amendment to have it go to OLS by Monday morning so they can have, um, they need three days basically and they might need a little bit more to do the amendment and to get it out to the public. Um, so um, this is not the way I wanted to end our work and I don't know if we're ever going to have a chance to come back again and I'm not going to cry about it because um, they're more important things to cry about. But um, if everybody's okay, then I um, adjourn this and I will um, look forward to seeing all of you on the, um, on the 28th at 10. And I cannot thank you enough for slogging through this, for participating as well as you have, and for this to go as smoothly as it could go under these difficult circumstances. So I will see you on the 24th. Representative, okay? there, was, there were two hands. Did you want to recognize them or no? No, I think we're done. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay.